Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's June. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. I um, I really want to thank Jean uh, for inviting me to be here at your conference and uh, and all of the committee for inviting me. I, I um <clears throat> I really love Florida. It's got uh, a very special place in my heart, and uh, and that's mostly because of some very special people. And uh, I really want to thank John um, for coming all the way out here to uh, spend some time with me. Um, John's like a father uh, to me. And uh, I got to come out here in January and help him and Helen celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary in Florida. And um, Helen wasn't feeling well enough yesterday to come, and um, I really appreciate her letting John come and him coming. Uh, I um, I also really want to thank Carrie. Um, I've had the privilege of sponsoring Carrie. And I met her at the uh, International Convention in San Diego when she uh, only had be a month or two, just a few months, and um, we've been able to share a lot of um, very, very special things, good and bad, uh, over the years. And, um, you know, when I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, there wasn't uh, there wasn't anybody in my own city that would drive across it to be with me. And... Uh, the fact that I have um, two friends like John and Carrie who uh, either flew or drove here um, to spend some time with me means a lot. I uh, I want to welcome those people who are new. And uh, I want to start by saying some of the things that I try to say anytime I'm asked to participate in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I, um, I'm not an expert on Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, or on alcoholism, or on anything else that I'm certainly going to be sharing about tonight, at least. And uh, I'm just a member. And I'm going to stand up here for a while and uh, share with you, as the big book suggests, that we do a little bit about what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like today. Uh, but it's really important that I um, make sure that you knew, know a few things. There was a, uh, a meeting today that I really enjoyed that was led by Jim about the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I know many of you were able to be there. Um, I've been very fortunate, I think, in Alcoholics Anonymous because I was, uh, I got sober in a group that was very active and we had a lot of fun activities, which I think is really important and wonderful. But we also uh, spent a lot of time in service work and I was led into the traditions. Um, and led into general service work, which is actually how John and I first became um, such special friends a long, long time ago. But I, um, I'm, I'm so grateful that Alcoholics Anonymous has a set of traditions, you know, and uh, in particular the, uh, the third tradition, the one that says that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And uh, Jim shared about some of the stories and some of the rules and conditions that they were originally considering, and there's a whole list within the, uh, the 12 and 12. Uh, and I've always, uh, I've often read that list, and sometimes I've read it in the course of giving a talk, because it, as I've read that list, I've always known that neither I nor any of my sponsors, and certainly most of my friends, would have ever been allowed into Alcoholics Anonymous if they'd used that list uh, of requirements, you know. So I'm very glad that they kept it simple. But I, um, I also want to be sure, particularly if you're new, or if you are just in your early days in Alcoholics Anonymous, because so many people today uh, get here in so many different ways, and I don't really think it matters how you get to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's just important that you get here. But because people do come in in different ways, I want to be very clear and make sure that you know that Alcoholics Anonymous is absolutely free. Had Alcoholics Anonymous not been free, I could not have come here. Had Alcoholics Anonymous not remained free, I could not have stayed. I was over 10 years sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous before I could put a dollar in the basket. Uh, and, uh, and so this is not about money, you know, and that's really important. I want to make sure that anybody who's new who may have come in through some other kind of a program knows that. Um, I also want you to know that I'm not paid 
to come up here and talk, nor is anyone paid who participates in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's important for a number of different reasons. You know, one, because after the meeting when you're sitting in the coffee shop and you think they had to pay her for that, you know. So there's, <laughs> you know, there's always that element. But, but more importantly, it's because we're all just members in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's, that's just as high as it goes, you know. Um, I, uh, I live a life today that I never would have wanted, and I'm a person today that I wouldn't have even liked when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And what fascinates me the most about that is that I'm the kind of person that was never happy. I was never happy. Um, I wasn't happy before I started drinking. I wasn't really happy during my drinking. And I certainly wasn't happy when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And most of the time today, most of the time I'm happy. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it's just been such a series of paradoxes, the way that my life has unfolded, that it's also taught me that I really, I just have no idea. I just have no idea. I haven't known what was going to work right for me or be happy for me. I certainly don't know what might work or make you happy, you know, as we walk along this path. Um, and I've seen adventures and things happen in people's lives just beyond anything that I could have imagined. And I've seen it happen in mine. Uh, I, um, I spoke at a meeting, it's been a while now, but 26th and Broadway back in Santa Monica, uh, near where I live. And, um, been 10 years ago now, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not sure exactly, but a while. And this guy came up to me afterwards to thank me for talking mainly because his sponsor was standing behind him. And, uh, and he said, you know, I really want to thank you for sharing. Um, and he said, I, I really liked your talk. And he said, I don't believe it was your story, but I liked the way that you told it. <laughs> and I, you know, I've never forgotten that because I thought, you know, it's only in, I think, a place like Alcoholics Anonymous when we're new that we come here and we think, ah, oh, they probably make up stories, sit around, you know, they come for years and years so that they can stand in front of, I mean, you know, how could that happen, you know? But the main thing, the main thing that that meant to me was that this was someone who was hearing my story and who couldn't believe that I could have come from where I came from. And I thought, what a tribute to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I want to assure you, and there are actually a few people in this room today who can tell you that I looked like my story when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And no one doubted my story when I first walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. And not for quite a while afterwards. So it's really a tribute to Alcoholics Anonymous that someone could actually wonder if I'd really come from the places that I talked about. Uh, I'm a person who believes that uh, I was born an alcoholic. And uh, I don't want to have a philosophical discussion with any of you about that after the meeting. <laughs> It's something that I believe, and I believe it because there was something wrong with me before I ever started to drink, and alcohol immediately worked for me. And, uh, you know, it's much like I heard John sharing today. You know, I'm very grateful for alcohol and the chemicals that I mixed with it because I really believe I would have had to been locked up in some kind of an institution. I couldn't make it out there. But anyway, I, um, I think there was something wrong with me before all of that. Uh, my first obsession in life was suicide. And from the age that I can remember, which is about five years old, I began to try and cut my hands and fingers and wrists with razor blades. I began to try and kill myself in all the different ways that I could think of doing. Um, up and Till the time that I came through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't think that there were, was a day that I didn't try and take my life, pray to a God that I was slowly, slowly losing faith in, or <clears throat> put myself in a position where someone else was likely to take my life. And that was really what I wanted. You know, I, I thought about it in inventorying, and there have definitely been some times when my suicide attempts were to get attention or to get my way. Um, but really, overall, as I look back up to and including today, and I look back on those years, I really wanted to die. I really wanted out. Life just hurt way too much for me. And I didn't want to go anywhere, and I didn't want to be anything, and I didn't want anything exciting to happen. I just had already given up so long ago that, you know, I either have to assume that you've either experienced this or you haven't, because I don't know how to describe it. It was just the way that I was. Uh, and so for someone like me who always felt like that, um, who never liked anything about myself, not one single thing. I didn't like being tall. I didn't like being skinny. I didn't want to have curly red hair. I didn't like my nose. I didn't like the color of my skin. I didn't like, you know, the family that I was in. I didn't like the town that I lived in. I didn't like where I went to school. I didn't like anything ever. It all just hurt way too much for me. And I would have traded places. It felt to me I would have traded places with anybody 
You know, anyone in the world just had to have it better or look better or feel better than me. So for someone like me, you can see why I would be very grateful to have found alcohol and what I found with it um, to mix it so that I didn't have to feel pain. Now, given that I've told you that, I, I guess it won't surprise you when I tell you I, I was not a social drinker. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've never had a social drink in my life, nor did I ever want one, I don't, you know, I don't think. I, I, I ne I've never not been drunk. I've never not overdosed. It was really the only way that I, I just thought that was just the only way. Um, and I didn't want to feel good. And I know many of you had a lot of good party years and a lot of good times, you know, so that's certainly not true of everyone in Alcoholics Anonymous. But for me, I wasn't interested in feeling good. I just wanted to not feel anything at all. And I'm very grateful that I got a little bit of that relief during the years that I was out there drinking. Um, as a little kid, um, they, uh, you know, they would ask me, probably as they do every other kid, you know, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I told them I wanted to be a boy. Um, it wasn't as easy to do back then as it is today. <laughs> so uh, my family was very concerned that this was my answer. And, you know, in being sober and looking back on it, I know today that some of the reason for that was that before I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't ever remember seeing a man cry under any circumstances. I've seen men shot. I've seen them stabbed. I've seen them arrested. I've seen their wives leave them. I've seen their kids overdose. I've seen a lot of things happen. I never saw a man cry under any of those circumstances. Now, I've seen the women in my life go through every one of those events that I've just mentioned. Some of them didn't cry, but most of them did. At one point or another, there was a breaking point. And so I looked at those two different groups of people, and I decided immediately which one I wanted to be like. And I spent my whole life before coming to Alcoholics Anonymous trying to be that kind of a person, the kind of a person where nothing could make you cry, where no one could hurt you. And I suppose that that was important to me because of what Clancy talks about, that for me I was one of those people who had no emotional insulation whatsoever. Just absolute strangers could look at me funny, and, and it, would, it would hurt in a way that I just can't even describe, you know. Um, and I found for me that I would much rather you punch me in the face than hurt my feelings. And I spent a lot of my life making sure that that was the way that I interacted with people. You know, as getting my face punched in a lot. Just, you know, right now I had something to say to everybody right there, long before they could ever get close enough to hurt me or say anything to me emotionally. But the problem was, was that without alcohol, I could not control those emotions. And I could not control that pain or that fear or whatever it was. And I found for myself that I... My first memories were really, I mean, I just realized I was not going to be able to be this person that I so badly wanted to be, and I hated myself for it because I thought I was weak. And in my life, there's never been anything that I have been less tolerant of in anyone, most of all myself, than the things that I was to decide were weak. Um, anyway, I, um, I, grew up in a, uh, I grew up in a town called Venice in Los Angeles. It's a beach town. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic home. There was a lot of violence in my home. There was a lot of broken promises in my home. There were a lot of the same kind of things that go on in a lot of other alcoholic homes. Um, I, uh, I did not see my mother's alcoholism as a disease. Uh, I saw it as a weakness. And uh, I've already told you how I felt about weakness, so I didn't want anything to do with anything like that getting near me. Um, and when I was, you know, this little kid and I found out that I couldn't be a boy... Um, I had to, uh, we had, they had begun to take me to psychiatrists and psychologists because we were on welfare. We were able to go see these people. And, you know, I don't have any kind of diagnosis for you about what those professionals thought about why I tried to kill myself or why I hated myself so much or why I felt the way that I did because I, I felt like those people, much like my friend Patty Hicks always did, I thought they should have to work for their money. And so I never answered one question. I never filled out one form. I never played with one doll. I sat there the required 50 minutes, and when they were done, I got up and I left. And so, obviously, they weren't able to help me in any way. Uh, I, um, I found for me that if I wasn't going to be able to be a boy, that the only option, the only thing that seemed like an option to me was to be a tough broad. And I spent all my time before coming into Alcoholics Anonymous and a good part of it afterwards trying to be what I thought a tough broad was. And, you know... There were certain requirements I've learned, you know, in sobriety, having met a lot of other tough broads, that certain requirements can be geographical, you know, about that. Um, and there are definitely variations, you know, on the tough broad thing. There are, first of all, there are makeup-wearing tough broads and non-makeup-wearing 
tough broads. I was a non-makeup wearing tough broad because there wasn't any way I was ever going to look in a mirror long enough to put makeup on me. Um, so that, that was not uh, part of me. I, having grown up in a beach town, um, I've learned, you know, geographically from other tough broads in other parts of the country that it, some of this had to do with the beach community. It was very important uh, that you have tough feet. Tough broads in beach communities have tough feet. So one of my favorite things to do would be to stand with my gang, smoking a cigarette, and when touristy-looking people looked at me, I would throw my cigarette down on the sidewalk and put it out with my bare feet. And I would see the touristy people whisper back and forth to one another, and I knew what they were saying. They were saying, wow. <laughs> that is one tough broad. And I, I was very impressed, you know, that I, could, that I could show them the sights, you know. And again, after I'd been sober for a while, my sponsor explained to me that perhaps what some of those people were saying was, did you see that? <laughs> that person just put flesh to fire. Why would anybody do anything so stupid? But I didn't know there was another way of looking at it, you know. Um, in being in a gang, it was very important that you do a lot of fighting, and I did. Um, it's very important that I remember to tell you tonight that I've never uh, won a fight in my life. Uh, but I never fought less than five people at a time. And my sponsor explained to me after I've been sober for a while, you know, if you fight one person, and you lose, people might say, you're not a very good fighter. But if you always fight groups of five or more, no one expects you to win. And they think, maybe she's tough if that many people had to jump her. You know, so you can kind of get a reputation for yourself, although your face is beat in all the time. You know, so that was sort of the way I, I worked. That was, that was my, you know, planning. Um, anyway, I... Uh, I, in, in hanging around, um, my mom was in and out of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous um, for many, many years um, when I was a kid uh, in and out of Venice. Um, and so I, I went to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous or parts of them, um, but it didn't seem that it would work very long. You know, my mom kept drinking and going back and forth and, uh, you know, and whatever. Um, but my mom brought me to a, uh, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, and uh, she didn't bring me because I asked for help, and she didn't bring me because I admitted having a problem, and she didn't bring me um, for any reason, really, except that she was afraid if she left me alone, I might get her evicted from another apartment. And um, in that meeting um, that night, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous began for me. And it began for me because there was a guy in that meeting that I admired more than anybody else in the whole world. You know, if I had to tell you what I wanted out of life in one sentence when I came through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous... What I wanted was I wanted the ability to walk into a room full of strangers and have everyone there back away from me in terror. Now, when you're 87 pounds, that almost never happens, you know, but that's kind of what I wanted out of life, you know. And this guy that was there named Paul, who was actually a drinking friend of my mother's and who drank in the really, really tough bars where my mom drank, you know, in Venice, um, was at that... Uh, was at that meeting. And, uh, you know, Paul had been in prison and he had a, his knife with him at the meeting and he had, you know, ridden his motorcycle there. And, uh, you know, I'd seen him drinking in the bars and he, he had, he had achieved everything that I wanted out of life. He had the ability to clear rooms and tables when he had been drinking. And so it made a huge impression on me that someone like that would be an AA. Um, <laughs> And I didn't raise my hand because I wasn't an alcoholic, and even if I had been, I wouldn't have joined an organization that was allowing my mother to belong to it. So I, you know, I went to these, uh, I went to these meetings, though, for a couple of weeks, not raising my hand. And uh, I spent some time talking to Paul. He was the only person that I was willing to talk with um, in those couple of weeks because I didn't like anybody else. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't like anybody. I didn't like me and I didn't like anybody else. But I, I was willing to talk to Paul because he was so cool. And uh, I explained to him, you know, when he would listen, I wasn't an alcoholic, that I couldn't possibly be an alcoholic, that I was far too young to be an alcoholic, that I wasn't anything like my mother who was an alcoholic. And he knew what an alcoholic my mother was because they drank in the same bars, you know, and that I was just not alcoholic. And he said to me, you know, June, I'm pretty new in this AA thing. And they've told me I can't diagnose anybody's disease but my own. I said, but in your case, I'm going to make an exception. 
He said, I've seen the way that you drink, and I've seen the way that you take chemicals. And I happen to believe if you don't come into a program like this and take what these people have to offer you within a period of six months or less, you're going to be out on the streets, you're going to be shooting stuff, and you're going to be selling your ass. And I knew he wasn't trying, like, to scare me, you know, like a high school teacher who'd maybe make something up that they read in a book or something. He was just talking about facts. He was talking about things that had happened and were beginning to happen in my life. And I thought a little bit about what he said, but I did not want to join Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't think it could be that bad yet. And yet in that two-week period of time, absolutely every alternative but Alcoholics Anonymous was removed from my life. By the time I got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the only person that I hated more than my mother was myself. And I hated myself so much that I can't even describe it to you. I really don't believe that I could have gone on breathing in and out any more, you know, out there on the streets, hating myself any more than I did by the time I came in here. But I hated my mother, you know, for everything that had ever gone wrong in my life. And take it from me, the short version, a lot had gone wrong. And, uh, and I was very angry and I was filled with hatred and hostility and I was violent and I used to attack my mother. Um, and other than fighting back, you know, she didn't really do that much about it, except for now she was sober. And she didn't think she had to be attacked anymore. And she asked me to leave her apartment, and I did. The rest of my family had not spoken to me in a couple of years, and I was not able to call or go by, and I didn't bother. I had been in a lot of foster homes. I had been thrown out of all of them or taken out of them. I wasn't allowed to go back to any of those. I tried to get into some drug rehab and alcohol recovery homes that were in the L.A. area at that time. There were not that many, but there were some. None of them would take me, some because of my age and some just because of my attitude. I tried to get into a program back then that most of you may not remember, but it was a program called Synanon. And they were absolutely desperate for membership at the time, and they wouldn't take me either. So it was starting to look pretty bad. And then I thought, well, you know what? Who cares? Who cares about these programs and, you know, these families and, you know, all of that? Because none of that really matters. If you're a tough broad, the only thing that counts, the only thing that's important, the only thing that matters is your gang. And then one day as I walked down an alley, all five members of my own gang beat me up. And I found myself sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was 87 pounds, and I had a black eye, and I had a swollen lip, and I had no shoes, wouldn't have worn shoes if I'd had them. I had no place to live, I had no family, I had no money, and I raised my hand in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, you can see where it was kind of simple. It wasn't like, would you like to go to Hawaii or join AA? You know, it was a much clearer, you know, kind of a thing. Um, I know today that when I raised my hand in that meetings, I know that there were people there who did not know about the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. Again, once again, the third tradition. And the reason I know that they did not know that, uh, about that tradition is because they, uh, some of these people in that meeting who had known my mother from being in and out of the program and who knew who I was, knew how old I was. And they came over to me after the meeting and they told me I was too young to be an alcoholic. And they told me they didn't want a kid sitting in their meeting while they talked about serious things. And they told me if I came back, they'd get together and ask me to leave. And I didn't know that Alcoholics Anonymous had a set of traditions at that time. I just figured AA didn't want me either. And that was okay with me because I didn't want me either. And I had it for a long, long time. And I fell back on my number one answer, the answer I'd been using since I was five years old. Went over to a friend of my mother's house. I went into her bathroom, which is the first place I went at anyone's house I ever went into. And I found enough of the kind of pills to kill myself, and I took enough of them to do it one more time. And then that day, before I passed out, I went to a noon meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I don't know about the meetings here in Tampa, but in West Los Angeles, um, where I got sober, they almost never called on people to share who were laying in the meeting, um, <laughs> which is all that I was capable of. But they did call on me, and they recognized that I needed to be in a hospital, and that was where I came to. Uh, Paul took me to that hospital, and I... I came to with a doctor explaining to me that the pills I had taken were to slow down my heart, and uh, they gave me medication to make me throw up or whatever they did. And he told me that had I been there five or ten minutes later, I would have been in a coma that they probably couldn't have brought me out of. And I, I really can't tell you why that overdose was any different than all the other overdoses that I would inflicted upon myself. It just was. Because since that time, one day at a time, I haven't taken anything that affects me from the neck up. That's how I personally define sobriety. I've done that one day at a time. Uh, the 13th of July of last year, I celebrated 30 continuous years of sobriety in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to me that the new people know that I never planned on staying 30 years. <laughs> you know, again, sort of like what John was saying this this morning, this afternoon, you know, when the doctor was warning him he might not live to 30 if he didn't stop it. You know, I, 
If they'd have asked me in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous if I wanted to live for 30 more years, I would have checked the no box. You know, um, I'm not one of the people that stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous because I was afraid if I went back out on the streets, I might die. I tried to die as long and as hard as I could out there. I stayed in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because I was afraid I could go back out there and live the way that I was living. And I couldn't do that anymore, hating myself any more than I already did. You know, um, when I came in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, it may not surprise you that much, um, but I had a bad attitude. <laughs> I, um, I didn't like me. I didn't like my mother. And I figured uh, any other women around here were, you know, alcoholics and probably like one or the two of us or whatever, but I didn't like them. And so I didn't like sitting next to women. I didn't like shaking hands with women. I most certainly did not hug women. And I didn't like listening to women speakers, which is something that always makes me feel better because I know there's never as many people listening to me as it looks like. <laughs> um, most of the men that I had known in my life were alcoholic, and they were extremely violent. And I uh, figured they were men here, and they were obviously alcoholic, or they wouldn't be here, and I didn't want anything to do with them either. And so I had a problem because in July of 1972, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, all we had were men and women, and I didn't like any of them. <laughs> but I went to 21 meetings a week anyway, every week, for at least the first two, to th two and a half to three years uh, of my sobriety. And, um, and I had a commitment at most of those meetings. Um, but I also had my attitude. I didn't wear shoes most of the first two years um, that I was sober. I, um, I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day when I got to the program. I lit all of them myself. Occasionally, someone would hold a match, and I let them hold it as long as they liked. But they never lit my cigarette with it. Most of the time, I didn't take rides from people in AA. I either walked or I hitchhiked. Somehow that was different, I guess, than getting a ride from someone that I knew, you know. <laughs> or if I had enough money, I'd take a bus. Um, I wore motorcycle chains on my wrists and my ankles. I had a jacket that on the back said, do unto others and then split. It was my own spiritual philosophy. <laughs> After I had been sober a short period of time, I took up smoking cigars and then, you know, later a pipe. I had a very limited vocabulary when I came to AA. It consisted almost solely of profanity. There were a few exceptions, the and mother. <laughs> And I found a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous were very offended by the type of words that I used, and so I tried to use it more when they got near me. And, and what I want to let you know is if you choose to act that way and dress that way and smoke that way, you too can sit in a meeting pretty close to this size, really, and have an entire row all to yourself. Um, I mean, just to give you an idea, my home group today um, is the Thursday Night Brentwood Workshop. And uh, when I was 19 years, I think I was 19 years sober, the steering committee asked me to be secretary of my home group. And uh, after one of the first meetings, you know, that I had, uh, had chaired, one of my first sponsors uh, drove out from the valley. And he came up to me after the podium when I was signing the court cards, and he said, I heard a rumor in the valley that they made you secretary of this meeting, and I had to come and see if it was true. Because, really, in, in my early years of sobriety, no one thought that I was going to be secretary of anything, you know. Um, they didn't even think I was going to keep coming back, really, but I did. Um, and I'm very grateful to the old-timers uh, who tolerated me and the way that I was uh, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I can remember one of my commitments was at the Tuesday night Westwood 2 plus 2 meeting. I was the greeter. I would stand there barefoot with my cigars and motorcycle jacket and chains, welcoming the newcomers as they came to AA. <laughs> I'd shake hands with them, and uh, as they'd walk by, I'd hear their sponsors whisper, you know, if you keep drinking, you can end up like that. You know? <laughs> when I got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, people were guessing my age at 37. And I was 13 at the time. And I'll tell you, I just celebrated my birthday just a couple of weeks ago. I'm 44. And I feel at least a thousand years younger than I did when I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was so old. 
when I came to AA. And I was old for so long here. I don't know when it's going to catch back up with me that I'll feel that way again. I don't know. But I didn't think that feeling would ever go away. I, um, I got very active in my home group at the time was the Monday night Venice group. And it was, you know, a great meeting. And as I said, we did a lot of, uh, service work and we learned about loners and, you know, general service and the traditions. And we traveled around and we took groups and we went all over and, uh, you know, we went to meetings all over and I was just so lucky, you know, but you know, I, I really didn't think it wasn't exactly that I didn't think AA would work for me. I just, I just wasn't sure it would work the way it worked for these other people that I heard sharing. But there was so much hope here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the people who were here, the old timers, they had so much, you know, so much hope and so much to share that I, I really thought that maybe, maybe if I went to these meetings for years and years, not that I'd ever, you know, want to be who I was or look at myself, you know, um, and feel beautiful or, you know, walk on the sunny side of the street like some of them. I didn't think that could happen. But there was enough hope here that I did believe that someday if I went walking down a street and I happened to glance in one of those storefront windows and see myself looking back, maybe I wouldn't feel like throwing up at what I saw looking back. And that was enough hope to keep me coming to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and you know, the, the feelings of self-hatred that I had for myself, they did not go away when I took my 30 day chip or, you know, really for quite a long time. I, I wish I had a more hopeful message. You know, I don't think that it's true for everyone that it takes that long. Um, and I think that some of it did have to do, you know, with self-obsession. And, uh, I heard someone not that long ago at my home group and they were saying that, you know, an egomaniac, because I never really identified with that. You know, I, think, well, I never thought that well of myself. You know, I wasn't an egomaniac. I never thought I was better than anybody or, you know, anything else. But they were saying, you know, an egomaniac is really, it's not necessarily someone who thinks well of themselves. It's not even someone who thinks often of themselves. It's simply someone who thinks only of themselves. You know, <laughs> I thought, well, that would definitely be me, you know. Uh, I, um... I also, I had a bad attitude about, um, people in AA who I didn't feel had suffered like I suffered. So I was one of the worst forms of snob to ever have arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous because I had a lot of judgments. I had a lot of things, you know, like if you had a mother and a father, <laughs> you didn't come from where I came from and you'd had an easy life. That was my feeling. Um, if you had a car, we didn't have a car. You know, I mean, it was like I could cross everybody off my list for, you know, as far as the pain quotient. And I always won, you know. I really just didn't think, you know. And then there were people, you know, and they had, like, money. Oh, yeah, right. You know, like they had pain, you know. So it was it was really easy for me to get myself into this little tiny group. And yet it talks about in the book that we are people who normally would not mix. And I cannot ever think of that line without thinking of my first sponsor, Gail Wilson. And Gail became my sponsor, and it was a woman. Now, that's a big thing right there in and of itself. This is a fascinating thing to me, how this came about. But, you know, and I went to these 21 meetings a week. It seemed as though a woman named Gail talked at him about 18 times a week. So I thought to myself, I thought, maybe if I ask her to be my sponsor, I can find out ahead of time where she's speaking, and then I won't have to go hear her all the time. So that was sort of, that's what motivated me to get her for my sponsor. But Gail and I, you know, we were so different. First of all, she was three times my age. Um, she was a very successful businesswoman. She'd come from a loving family in the South. <laughs> I mean, really. She... <laughs> She not only did not use the same language that I used, she didn't know what most of the words I was using meant, you know. And as if all of that wasn't bad enough, which I felt that it was, really, she had actually been seen in public on numerous occasions wearing pink, okay, something that I did not even sit in a row if someone was wearing pink for at least 10 years, you know. We did not get anywhere near the pink thing. So 
and you know, I would see Gail, and her home group at the time was the Thursday night Brentwood group, which I hated. I had to go because it was her home group, but I hated that meeting, uh, the one that I became secretary of 19 years later. But anyway, <laughs> uh, and I would see Gail at the meeting, and she would say, now, June, don't sit next to me at the meeting tonight. She said, I can't take the cigar smoke. <laughs> and then I'd turn to walk away, and she'd say, and not only that, please don't tell anyone that I am your sponsor. <laughs> and, you know, that was fine with me because... You know, I didn't want anybody to know I was hanging out with someone as lame as she was. You know, we'd sort of meet secretly, you know, after meetings and, and talk about AA. Um, anyway, I got, uh, I can remember, you know, the first time I talked at my home group, the Monday Night Venice group, uh, I gave, a, I was asked to give a 20-minute talk. I think I was about nine months or a year sober. And when I finished talking, the secretary came over to me after the meeting, and he said, if I'd wanted to hear your mother's story, I would have asked her to talk, you know. And I was still so wrapped up in what my mom had did, and then she did this to me, and then she did this, and then they did this, and, you know, that whole thing. And so it's really been a very slow process for me um, of going ahead and seeing, you know, how these steps apply to my life, you know. And, and it's just been fascinating. You know, I, um, I came here, I have a seventh grade education, um, I was not able to read any longer. I had known how to read, but I could not read. I, I shouldn't say it exactly that way. I could read words, but I could not hold all the words in one sentence and have them make sense at the end of reading the sentence. And I, very, I had a very difficult time reading the literature in AA or reading anything. You know, my brain just would not work that well. And I didn't know if it was ever going to get any better, you know, and... Uh, I just didn't know, but I just kept coming to meetings anyway, and I just kept keeping my commitments and uh, and staying active, you know. And uh, you know, we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, I had the uh, the privilege of getting to go to the international um, convention in Denver, and I was about three years sober, and uh, I stayed on an old timer's floor in the hotel room, and uh, I got to stay with Marion Chapman, and I I went out there, and uh, you know, I, when I was there, I ended up running into a group of uh, 43 people who were there from New Zealand. And I spent that whole weekend with all these people from New Zealand. And, you know, when I got sober, um, in, well, I, I had run away once um, from Venice in my life, and I'd made it to Culver City, which is six miles east you know, of Venice. That was about as far <laughs> as I had gone in my life. Um, Anyway, and, you know, and here I was, I'm in Denver, and I'm hanging out with these people from New Zealand. And I was thinking about this just the other day, because that was in July. And um, that year in December, I got two Christmas cards from New Zealand. I still wasn't getting Christmas cards from my own family, you know, um, because there had been a lot of damage there, and it took a really long time to heal it. But I got these Christmas cards, you know, from these people in New Zealand. And... Um, it was just just an amazing thing, you know, that people who would normally not mix, you know. I, um, when I was a couple years sober, I decided to go to school. Um, at night, I, I was working all, I had a lot of jobs, and I had the kind of jobs that you can get with a seventh grade education, and that's what my sponsors told me I was going to continue to have unless I was willing to do some footwork, and I wasn't for a long time. But I went ahead and I took this class. Uh, I went to school, actually, just so I could get that driving class because I wanted to eventually get a license. That's what motivated me. And uh, while I was there, I signed up for what they called a dummy English class. And that's what they called it. You know, oh, you want dummy English? It's like, yeah, that's me, <laughs> dummy English. You know, So I thought maybe I could learn to read again. And I signed up for that class. And, um, and I finished those first two classes. And those two classes that I finished, those were the first things that I had ever shown up for and finished in my life, and I had learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had learned how to show up and stay and finish something. Um, and I, um, I finished those classes, and I decided to take a couple other classes, and uh, I kept taking some other classes. And a few years later, they called me into the school, and they told me that I'd completed all the requirements for what they called an AA degree. Um, and I thought that was a nice name for a degree. You know, I never wanted a college degree. Uh, I wasn't, that wasn't on my list, you know, but, uh, but I was really amazed, you know, that I had finished all those requirements. And I, I did graduate from, uh, the city college and, uh, I went ahead and I did some other footwork and I was accepted to some colleges and I chose one and I went ahead and I continued, uh, at college and I continued to work full time, um, 
and uh, or multiple jobs, you know, in order to do that and continue to show up and stayed active in general service and in my home group. And I, I ended up graduating a few years later from college. And uh, and I'd come up with this dream along the way. And so I went ahead and I did the footwork for this dream that I had. And uh, I got a telegram. Oh my goodness, let's see. I think it's been almost 20 years ago now, um, telling me that I'd been uh, chosen as one of 300 out of 3,000 applicants to go to law school. And I'll tell you, I had always planned on spending a lot of time in court, um, <laughs> but never on that side of the table, you know. And uh, and I was able to go on and, uh, and go to law school and to show up. And I was very scared, and it was very, very hard, and it was hard intellectually, but that wasn't the hardest part. You know, it was still, I, I still had a lot of spiritual lessons, and uh, and I'm very, very grateful. I think I learned um, a lot of really good spiritual lessons there. Um, because it was there that I really began to see that I was one of God's kids. That I wasn't any better than anybody else or any less than anybody else. And even though some of these kids and people, you know, had come from a lot of different backgrounds, far different than mine, um, it didn't necessarily mean that they were better or that I was better or, you know, anything else, you know, and I just kind of got into just being one of God's kids for the most part. And it's been a lesson that I constantly need to remind myself of when I'm out there in the world still, just to make me try and be, you know, comfortable and uh, in, in where I am, you know, and I don't need to be special or different or unique in that way. Uh, anyway, I um, I kept showing up and uh, and doing the best I could. Um, I was scheduled to graduate in May of 1983, and uh, in Jan, well, actually in February of 1983, it became very clear that my sponsor, Gail Wilson, um, was dying of cancer at 48 years old. And um, I spent a lot of time with Gail in that last couple of months before I graduated, and you know, she was she was very sick. She was in a lot of pain, and so you know she was in the hospital almost continually from February to April. And um, I would I would be in the hospital, and these nurses were you know constantly coming in and out. And uh, Gail never did not stop whoever these people were. They'd walk in and she'd go, "Excuse me, excuse me, Nurse Smith, Nurse Smith, I want you to meet Junie." She said, "Junie is like a daughter to me, and she's going to be a lawyer." And I think you know this is the same woman who used to say. Don't sit next to me at the meeting, and don't tell anyone that I am your sponsor, you know. And uh, and Gail and I talked about that. We talked about, you know, how that could be, that she would be doing this now, and why it was so different, you know, back then. And, you know, she said, you know, Gail, I mean, she said, she said I never believed in June. Said, I never believed it. She said, when you asked me to be your sponsor, I said yes, because I had been taught to. She said, but I knew you weren't going to make it. She said, I knew with your background and your attitude, you were going absolutely nowhere. And she said, and, you know, I just was amazed that you hung around as long as you did. She said, you know, in those early years. But she said, I still, I never really thought you were going to make it. She said, and I remember you called me one day and you said, hey, Gail, I'm going to take a class over at the city college. She said, I knew you'd never finish. You hadn't finished anything. You hadn't held a job for, you know, more than a week in a row. I mean, you couldn't do anything other than your AA commitments. And she said, but I didn't say anything. And she said, and then I remember you took a few more classes, and then you called me up and you said, hey, Gail, I think I want to be a lawyer. She said, I had to force myself not to laugh out loud. She said, I knew you couldn't do that. She said, that was eight years of school, you know. She said, it just couldn't happen. She said, but I didn't say anything. And we talked about why she hadn't said anything. And even though Gail never believed in June, or that June could accomplish anything, Gail always believed in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because she had seen incredible things happen here to people that you would never think they could happen to. And that's why she didn't say anything, you know. And Gail did, she passed away in April of that year. I graduated from law school in May of that year. Um, when you graduate, from law school, just in case some of you don't know this, because I really didn't know any of this. Um, in order to practice law, you have to um, take an exam called the bar exam. And uh, so I, I studied really hard, and I worked really, really hard, and I stayed active, and I tried to stay spiritually fit and, you know, do my stuff and go to my meetings. And I did all my studying, and I took this test in July of 1983, and I got a telegram in November of 1983, and it told me I did not pass 
the bar exam, and I could not practice law. And I absolutely could not believe it. I was 10 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had, it was the end of November, it was like the day before Thanksgiving. I had enough money in my bank account to pay my rent on December 1st, and that was it. I couldn't buy peanut butter, I couldn't buy potatoes, I couldn't put a dollar in the basket. I was supposed to speak at a meeting that night, and I wasn't sure I had enough gas. I couldn't get a job because of that. I owed student loans that were going to begin to start coming due. And I I can't even tell you how much I didn't want to go speak at that meeting that night. (laughs) I just can't even tell you. And uh, I called one of my best friends in Alcoholics Anonymous. I called Mike, and I told him, I said, I got to talk at this meeting. He said, I'll be there. I have no idea what I said at that meeting that night. I did not want to be there. Um, But I showed up, and then we went out to coffee, Mike and I, after the meeting. And we talked. I showed him the telegram. And I said, you know what that means? He said, well, what? I said, you know, it means this was ridiculous. What the hell was I thinking of? You know, I'm from Venice. I mean, I got this crazy idea, probably from some AA meeting, that I was going to go be a lawyer. You know, I mean, it was insane. They're all laughing at me. I mean, I I fooled myself. I can't believe I was, you know, this was ridiculous. I said, you know, this telegram shows that it is not God's will. I am a waitress. I'm supposed to be a waitress. That was as high as I should have been shooting. I got to stop. And he says, well, let me see that telegram. And he said, well, I think this telegram says you're supposed to take the test again. I said, no, it's not. That's not what it says. You know, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, have you ever had these conversations with your sponsor, you know, where, like, I can remember, you know, you're it's sort of like you, they just don't get it. You know, they're very slow. <laughs> I can remember in the early months of my sobriety, I'd call my sponsor and I'd say, you know, my rent is due and I don't have enough money. And they'd say, go to a meeting. <laughs> say, okay, maybe I spoke a little too fast. So let, me, let me go over it for you one more time. My rent, I know you don't have rent because you own everything, but some of us, you know, we have rent. And it's due. That means we have to pay it. And by the way, you know, my landlord's not in AA. You know, I mean, they want their money, you know. (laughs) And I don't have any money, you know. And they'd say, oh, go to a meeting, you know. And and it's sort of like if you walked up to someone and you said, what time is it? And they go, it's a horse. You know, this is, (laughs) this is not helping. You know, I... I'm just not getting it. And it was that kind of a conversation, you know, that I had with Mike. He said, I think you're supposed to take the test again. I said, Mike, I owe all this money. I have no money. I can't even, you know, I can only pay my rent. And I owe all these student loans. And he goes, well, why don't you borrow more? Uh, Well, all right, you know. So (laughs) I went ahead and I signed up to take the test again. I borrowed some more money and to take it. And, you know, right around then I got a, (laughs) just thought of this, I got a 12-step call from central office. I went and picked this woman up. We went to a meeting. She was kind of drunky poo when we went to the meeting and how that can happen. But after the meeting, by the time the meeting was over, she was kind of sobered up. And we went back to my place, my apartment, where I paid the last month of rent that I had, you know. And we were sitting there and uh, and she was crying and she said, I don't have a job. And I said, I don't either. <laughs> she said, she said, I I don't know if I can pay my rent. I don't, I don't either. <laughs> She's like, how long have you been sober? It's like 10 years, but really it's a good program. And, <laughs> you know, most people are doing a lot better by now. You know, just, God. <laughs> anyway, so um, I went ahead and I took the test again. Studied really, really hard. Got a different kind of job, you know, to, that, that I could get, and uh, took the test again in February of that following year. And uh, when I received a telegram in June uh, telling me that I had uh, that I had passed uh, the exam and that I'd be allowed to practice law in the state of California, and uh, you know, I I would love to tell you that I had 
you know, that spiritually I'd felt the same way about both telegrams, but really I felt a lot closer to, you know, I thought the program was working a lot better when I got that telegram. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, anyway, I, um, and I was able to get a job, um, that I loved very, very much and a job where I believe I'm able to be of service and, uh, and a job where I see people, uh, who were members of Alcoholics Anonymous and aren't anymore in the places that, uh, that we end up going sometimes, uh, when that happens or people who never got a chance to get here. Um, so it, it's a, it's a, been a fabulous job for me. And, you know, after I had done that job for about, I think four or five years, um, they call me in the office, some of my bosses, and, uh, and they said, we want you to be a trainer. We want you to help and teach the lawyers because we love your attitude. <laughs> and I thought, no, whoever thought I'd get a job for this attitude, for my attitude, you know, it's just, it's really, it's really unbelievable. So anyway, and so I was able to do that for a while. And, um, you know, when I got to the program, um, I was single and you know, I think if you're 13, that that is an excellent idea to be. <laughs> but at the time, I, I really wasn't sure that was a good thing. And, um, and you know, I, I got some bad news for you if you are single. It was bad news for me anyway. And that is that you're probably going to have to date. Now, I have always hated dating. I would much rather fall in love. And usually I would. I'd just fall in love on the way to the coffee pot. And then if he came to me the next night with someone else, I thought he was being unfaithful, you know, and I'd <laughs> call my sponsor and write about it, and I could just do a whole thing, you know. Um, and, you know, I don't know about here in Tampa, but in, uh, in West L.A., we have a lot of AA dates, and that's where someone asks you out, and then they take you to a meeting. <laughs> where else would you go, you know? Then after the meeting, you go to coffee, and you talk about the meeting, and then they take you home. By then, you don't know whether to kiss them goodnight or say the Lord's Prayer, you know. <laughs> And uh, I can remember I was on one of these dates one night. We were at the coffee stage of our date. And he said, I really like you. And I said, thank you. He said, I really, I really like you a lot. I think you're really nice. I said, thank you. He said, but I like your girlfriend at the next table better. Do you mind if I go sit with her? And he did. And I went home and I thought things through, which is one of those times where my sponsors have taught me over the years that I have never yet had a problem that has been as bad as my solution for it. But I... <laughs> I thought it through. I came up with the only answer, and I went down the next morning, and I tried to join the United States Air Force. And they wouldn't take me, so then I called my sponsor, which is kind of pretty much what I recommend. Go to the Air Force. If they won't take you, then you might want to call your sponsor. You know. <laughs> anyway, I, um, when I was in law school, I was asked out on a date. Um, and uh, I, I really wasn't sure because... He had never been in prison. He didn't have any tattoos. And I just didn't know if it could work, you know, with that kind of a background, you know. Um, but we ended up, we did end up going out, and we went out for a while. And uh, in 1988, um, we decided to get married. And, you know, I had been sober 15 years by the time that I got married. And when I got married, I wore shoes, by the way, just, just in case anybody was wondering. And... Uh, I spent quite a few hours picking out the right ones, too. But uh, when I uh, got married, every member of my family either drove or bought an airline ticket or did something in order to be there. Um, and one of the members of my family, my uncle, gave me away at that wedding. And uh, that could not have happened, you know, in the early years of my sobriety because it was such a long healing process. Two members of my family came from another country that had never met me to represent my grandparents. And that could not have happened, given that the ones who knew me <laughs> weren't speaking to me, you know, in the early years of my sobriety. Uh, I, um, and as I walked down there to get married, I didn't want to be wearing anybody else's dress. I wanted to have curly hair and I wanted to be tall, and I wanted to be skinny, and I wanted to be from Venice, and I wanted to have the alcoholic mom that I had had and the life that I had had because I knew that all of that took me to where I was right there in that day, and I didn't want to trade places with anyone. 
And I think it would be wonderful if I could tell you that all the time it's like that. It's still not. It's not quite. But most of the time, almost always, I wouldn't trade places with anyone for the places that I am and that I have and the things that I have in my life today. You know, in the, uh, I was thinking all of a sudden, in the first 30 days that I was sober, um, I got to hear Sybil Corwin talk at that 2 plus 2 meeting. And she stood up there and she said, and she had 42 years then, I think 32, sorry, she had 32 years at that, when I had 30 days. She had 32 years, first woman sober west of the Mississippi. She was standing up there and she said, you know, my life is wonderful. I have a fabulous life. I'm happy. I love everything about my life. And she said, and if I could give it to you, I wouldn't. (laughs) And I thought, God, what's wrong with her? You know, that was sort of a trick ending. (laughs) I thought, I mean, if she could, you know, I mean, I just don't, you know, I can understand she can't, but if she could, I mean, does she know how much trouble I'm having? You know, I've, you know, I barely made it back to her talk because I was thinking of me, but anyway. (laughs) And she said, you know, I wouldn't because I wouldn't rob you of the journey. You know, and it really is. It's so amazing, you know, this journey that we have. And that doesn't mean that there aren't bumps and hills, volcanoes, you know, all kinds of things, you know, along our journeys. Um, I, um, when we, uh, when, when we, after we had been married, um, for a while, um, we, we thought we'd like to have a, um, a baby. Um, I was, by the time I got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in that first year or two that I was uh, sober, I I was in the hospital many, many times. I didn't have insurance, but I was hospitalized for a number of um, hemorrhaging problems and very serious problems. And from the time that I was 15 on, the doctors told me I needed a hysterectomy, um, but I didn't have insurance and no one would do one anyway because I was too young. But they said I had just done so much damage to my body that they just, there wasn't just any way they were going to be able to uh, fix anything. And so I, um, I didn't think that I would ever be able to have a child, but um, I did get pregnant, and um, I had a little girl um, after I'd had a couple of miscarriages, but I did, I had a little girl and um, in 1991, and about six months later, when I had gone to the doctor, um, because I, I had a very bad case of the flu, uh, she explained to me that I was pregnant again, and uh, they call those Irish twins, they told me. And, uh, and I had another, uh, little daughter named Jessica and, uh, I had, I, I had, <clears throat> I had another miscarriage, um, after that, but, um, later I had another little daughter named Casey and, uh, and I have these three little girls, you know, and I really, when I first found out I was having a girl, I was terrified because I mean, I didn't even want to be a girl till I was like 30. You know, I thought, what, <laughs> you know, I don't know ribbons, you know, I, the makeup, I, I don't know, you know, I never figured out whether I had the heart shaped face. I mean, I just don't know that stuff, you know? Um, but I also, uh, you know, I thought that was another one of those things that, you know, it could never have happened earlier, you know, in my life or earlier in my sobriety, you know, because, uh, there wasn't anything about me that I would have ever in those early years of sobriety or before taken a chance on passing on to anybody because I hated everything about me. I didn't think there was anything good about me. I didn't think there was anything worth saving about me. And so I would never, ever, and I was very careful to make sure I never took a chance on passing what I was on to someone else. You know, and by the time I had these kids, I didn't feel that way. You know, people would say, you know, gosh, she looks so much like you. I mean, those would have been fighting words for me in the early years. And I said, right, you know, and I can say thank you. I know she's really cute. She didn't get curly hair, but she'll be all right, you know. And uh, I'm going to tell you a couple little stories uh, um, about my kids, and I'm going to sit down. I When uh, after when we were having our third child, um, we, needed, we needed to move, and we were going to get a little bit bigger house. But at this house, I had never had a house. Uh, before and we had this house and the house was it was cute you know it was a nice little house but it had a tree I'm a tree person I don't know exactly why but you know maybe it's the Irish in me you know the land but I had this tree and it was a 45 year old tree in my backyard and I just loved this tree and uh, and so we were going to have to we were moving and so I was having to move from my tree and I was outside by the tree one day and I was kind of crying because I was leaving my tree 
And, uh, and my little four-year-old daughter said, Mommy, why are you crying? And I said, you know, because I'm really sad. I, I really love this tree, you know, and I, we're not going to have this tree. We don't have any tree. You know, it's my tree. And, and she said, well, she said, you know, maybe it's time for another family to have a turn to have a tree. You know, and you think, gosh, I should probably ask her to be my sponsor, you know. <laughs> I never thought of that, you know. Like, <laughs> oh, all right, you know. <laughs> But it's my tree. But anyway. You know, I read different kinds of um, spiritual literature. I, I really like stories. I'm just sort of a story person. Um, it works better for me. I can't remember people's names very well. But, you know, if you tell me they had the Doberman that drank vodka, I'll usually remember. You know, that's sort of how I am. So I read these little, you know, spiritual literature things. And sometimes they're little stories. I read this one story in the morning, and I can't even tell you exactly, you know, where I got it from. Um, but anyway, some little meditation book. And it was a story about Gandhi. And Gandhi was um, with a group, and he had just given some kind of talk, I think. Um, and he was traveling by train to someplace else. And as he was traveling, he was they were running late. And so they had to run to catch this train. I mean, the train was literally moving. And they had to jump on the train. And as he jumped on the train, one of his shoes came off and fell. And so as soon as he got up on the train, he took off his other shoe and he threw it out there. And one of his followers said, why did you do that? And he said, because if a person came along and they found one shoe, it would be of no value to them. But at least this way, if they came along, they would find a pair and maybe someone could put them to use. Well, I, you know, I thought of this, and I thought, you know, what an incredible spiritual idea, you know, but I, I can't even tell you. When I lose an earring, <laughs> I mean, I know where it, it's got to be here somewhere. We're tearing everything out of the drawers. I, or, or when I drop something, I mean, I can't even think of dropping the other earring because I might find the first earring. I mean... I have so I just I thought about this. I mean, I this comes up for me. I think about that and I think, gosh, throwing that other sandal, you know, I mean I'm thinking maybe I could buy one more at the store. I mean, you know, it's just not and uh and I never really I don't think I ever shared that story with anybody ever, but it really just it was something I just have thought about so many times. And about three years ago, I came out of school with my middle daughter and we were running to my truck and she was climbing up the you know, the little runner board to get in the truck. And um, and she says, Mom, I lost my shoe. And I said, what? What do you mean, Jess? And I came around, and I looked, and sure enough, you know, we're right by a gutter. And her shoe had come off, you know, it just fallen off, and it had fallen in the gutter. I mean, you couldn't see it. It was, like, way down there. You know, you couldn't even see it. And I go, oh. And she said, should I throw the other one down there? <laughs> but it's, oh my God, I'm raising Gandhi. You know, I thought, <laughs> how did this stuff happen? You know, I, I don't know where she came up with that, you know. But <laughs> anyway, I, um, I live a life that I never would have wanted, you know, and I am a person that I wouldn't have even liked. And I have so much fun. I actually sometimes experience a fear of dying, which is so weird for someone like me who had spent so many years wanting to die and to get out. There's so many things that I want to see and that I want to do and people I want to meet and spend time with, you know. And I just, I don't know how that happened. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't have any dreams. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to be anyone, you know. And I went to lots and lots of these meetings. And they helped me find some dreams. And then people like you helped make them come true. You know, there's a speaker that for me has always been very, very special. And I strongly recommend that you get a tape if you haven't uh, already ever heard him. And uh, in Los Angeles, you know, he was from there and his name is Norm Alpey. And every time I ever heard Norm Alpey share in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I wanted to join AA. And then I'd remember that I already was a member or I wouldn't have been there, you know. But he had so much enthusiasm, and he was just very, very special to me, you know, the way that he talked about AA. And one of the things that Norm always said was he would say, you know, but for the grace of God, rooms like this and people like you, 
I could have missed it all. Thanks for not letting me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.